Hey, welcome to the Happy Ramp Podcast. I am Ted Cluck, joined as always in studio by my good friends and partners in radio, Barnabas Piper and Ronald J. Martin. And boys, we have uh, we have all three of us back in studio this week. Uh, we have a, a, a complete show, and we have a complete lineup of uh, of really scintillating and fascinating topics to uh, to wander to and fro throughout. But Piper, before we do any of that. Um, you have two scintillating and fascinating books to promo for us, uh, which is a thing that you are not at all apathetic about and are actually really excited to do. So, no, I think, uh, I think the term Jordan, is gung ho. That's how gung I feel ho, about man. these things. You're, you're gung ho. If you were a speaker at like a motivational business conference, you would be like pointing excitedly at a flip chart and uh, talking into one of those headset mics right now. So, That's right. Piper, do your thing. Let's uh, let's do business. Let's make business history on the program. Go. All right. Our first sponsorship is from Tyndale Publishers and Nav Press. It is the book Down to Earth. You may have heard us talk about this the last few weeks. This is actually their last week of sponsorship, so this is your last mm. chance to hear from us about the book Down to Earth. Tommy but, Hughes is packing up. That's We're gonna right. have to. Well, Tommy Hughes never wrote this book. It's Pastor Tom Hughes. Tommy Hughes would have been way more interesting. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's right. This is this is uh, this is Jorts and Calf Socks. Tom Hughes writing <laughs> down to earth. It's a book about Jesus' parables, looking at how the parables connect us to just sort of the real stuff of Christian life. So prayer life, um, looking at money, looking at giving, looking at happiness and unhappiness, just those things. It's so it's devotional. It is reflective. It's biblical. Uh, he has been a pastor for a long time. If you go to downtoearthbook.com, you can learn more. You can check out the various endorsements. They're not as cool as the other book we have coming up, but uh, there's some solid ones on there. So check out Down to Earth from Pastor Tom Hughes and Nav Press. That one is available now, and you can get yours anywhere you buy books. Our other sponsor is Waterbrook Multnomah, longtime sponsor of this podcast. They are they are one of our most consistent sponsors and uh, they're good people. Have yes. you boys ever done any books with Waterbrook, Multnomah? Didn't you guys co-author one with them? Baby, we did one. Did we, Big R? Okay. Yeah, we Who did Who was our one. editor over there? I don't remember that one at all. <laughs> I, uh, I don't remember it being Waterbrook. I remember doing the book, obviously. It was Waterbrook. It was, uh, it was, it was Stoddy, remember? Stoddy! Yes, dude. Yes. How's Stoddy? Have you, have you seen or heard from that guy in years? I have, yeah. I saw him. I actually saw him at the airport uh, sometime last year, and we, we chatted. We hung out a little bit. It was great. Of course you I had, did, baby. Yeah, I grabbed uh, I grabbed coffee with him at the Gospel Coalition. He is uh, he's doing. There I didn't you go. Call, I didn't. I have never written a book with Waterbrook Multnomah, but I do know Andrew Stoddard because he was at David C. Cook when I signed with them, and there so uh, I, I had some connection with him there. Good dude. Um, Thought he is a good. Yeah, yes. tip of the cap to. Uh, but Piper, lest we get off track, tell us about yeah. uh, this this thing. The book is Rise of the Servant Kings, What the Bible Says About Being a Man. It is by Ken Harrison, who is currently the chairman of Promise Keepers, an organization that still exists, in case you thought it didn't anymore. Um, right. So it is, a, it is a look at how servanthood, humility, and sort of the depth of Christ-like character are really the core aspects of genuine manhood. So kind of flying in the face of... Uh, toxic masculinity, aggressive masculinity, those aspects of masculinity that we often um, poke fun at. So I think we would resonate with the tone of this book. Uh, the endorsers on this one, however, are spectacular. We have discussed Evander Holyfield's endorsement. We've discussed Bill McCartney's endorsement. We have John Stone Street, who is a he's sort of a cultural apologist. We have Ed Stetzer, who endorses every single book. He's sort of he's aspiring to be the next J.I. Packer. Dude, what did Steady say about it? Or, or do we have a better one? Do we have one to parse this oh, week? I think let's let's go with Stetzer's. His is a his would be his would be a fun one. Um, now, who's Stetzer? Like, where is he on the spectrum of like? Is he a reformed guy at all, or is he just like broadly evangelical? What's his he's, deal? I think he's theologically reformed, but he sort of eschews labels. Oh, so he I sort see. of leans into like church planting and evangelism and cultural engagement, but he's going to be generally reformed. Although he will probably. 
So Ed and I used to work together at Lifeway. He actually likes to claim credit for my having been hired there. Um, mm. So if he hears about this, he may well text me and, and berate me for whatever I say because he just likes to berate me. Um, I feel like I have other friends who are reformed but don't like saying they're reformed who like Ed Stetzer. So that that could be the – yeah. Yeah, he they, leans they very kind of heavily into church planting and sort of mm-hmm. solid cultural engagement. He's now the director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton. So his endorsement is, uh-huh. uh, it says, Ken Harrison is the kind of person he writes about. He's mm-hmm. a man of character and conviction, and much of his book calls us to a similar path. I'm worried about the other parts of the book. Um, yeah. I'm thankful the rise of the servant kings will encourage men to be who God has called them to be. All of which says Ed Stetzer did not read this book. But absolutely, it's the it's the endorsement about the guy. Which, to be fair, I've done before. Like so and so is a terrific guy. You're really going to benefit from his wisdom. Subtext: I haven't read one page of this. That's right. Yeah, I I got. I think I've shared this story before. There's one book I sent out for endorsements, uh, one of mine, and I got I got an endorsement back in 11 minutes from <laughs> one well-known pastor who I will not name. But uh, it, it led me to believe that he did not, in fact, read the book, that the math didn't add up. In 11 minutes. That's yeah, right. yeah. It's, it's <laughs> tough to make the math work on that one, isn't it? Maybe yeah. he's a speed reader. I mean, there's, 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 I don't even be. think you could turn every single page in 11 minutes, though. And my books aren't that <laughs> long, but still, like, that's, that's a lot of pages. Um, so the book is The Rise of the Serving Kings, What the Bible Says About Being a Man by Ken Harrison from Waterbrook and Mult- Multnomah. Father's Day is coming up, so this would be an apt gift if you are a book giver for Father's Day. Check this one out. Uh, it is also available now wherever you like to buy your books. Go check this one out. Mm, there it is. Solid there workmanlike promo. Um, Ronald, what's it like to be back in the studio hearing the promos from, from Piper? Oh, I think it's it's the best part of everything we do every week, like it hands really down. Is. It hands really down. is. If that's true, we should quit doing this podcast. Uh, maybe, we should, maybe we should just quit this particular podcast <laughs> right now. <laughs> baby, maybe that would of, be a fantastic idea. Speaking of being back to places, you're back home, so our condolences to you on that. But has has home changed in any way? Oh, has it's has been, Ashland uh, it's, changed in any, any sort of uh, mentionable ways? It's changed quite a bit. I mean, they have they have things. You know, they've modernized. They have things here. Yeah, that they didn't I mean, have. you leave for two months. Wait, did they know, get so internet? Really going to recognize the place? Yeah, yeah. we have internet. We have uh, we have bottled water and <laughs> um, electricity. It's oh, it's, it's huge, baby. Yeah, yeah, it's massive. You've got Edison bulbs, like for for the hipsters in the community. We have Edison bulbs, and yeah. uh, by the way, we have uh, we have some new friends that moved to town. Big T. Oh, that was the thing. That was that it. Was so tell thing. us about that, Big R. Well, we uh, we had uh, we have the uh, the original the original OG the original Happy Ran OG one mm. Stephen Trogues Al Trogi and Dave. wife Jen and kids I don't know their names have yeah. uh, moved to town and they are now uh, a town residents. Wow, baby, that's huge. It's big. Now, I have been to Ashland. I've been several times, so I know the community a little bit. So, what uh, what kinds of like quintessentially Ashland activities have you done with the Al Trogi family? Well. Um, I mean, they Besides just dropped taking a photo with duck lips. Yeah, we did that. We we dropped well, that's in on standard. That needs to happen ASAP. We dropped in on Sunday. We helped them unpack. And by helping them unpack, I mean, we got there an hour after they were unpacked. Sure. And yep. um, and since then, all I've done, the only time I've had with Trogues is I, I actually I I gave him an intro to a town. I gave him a welcome to a town lunch today at at a place called Union Town. So oh. there you go. Union yeah. Town, I don't think was there when I was there. What are we no, looking at? Is that? Hipster it's Bistro? New, yeah, no, it's a it's a hipster brewery in the downtown. Brewery. Yeah, nice. It's big. That's huge. It's, it's where we, we it's where we would have spent Big T approximately one hundred percent of our time. Baby, where was the, where was the place we went? Where um, we went with another gentleman, and we took note of the sort of male propensity for like judging what the other person orders. Like, I think I ordered a salad, and this guy like. Busted my chops for it for a half hour. Oh, like, yeah, like yeah. what? You're not eating a steak? You know, you're not eating like a plate full of rocks? You know, what's wrong with you? Are you even a yeah, you're, man? You you're know? not gurgling razor blades for dinner? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. What was that place? Um, Dude, what what was it? Dude, did we, was it in A-Town or did we go out of town for that? No, I, I think it was in A-Town. It was, was it? it was like an off-brand Applebee's or whatever. It was just sort of dude, like was a... It like, was it like a BW3? Ooh, is that an Applebee's but worse? That exactly. sounds delightful. It wasn't a B dubs. It wasn't it was some kind of like local place. But yeah, I don't I don't remember. But I do remember having that convo with him. I know, man. That was yeah. that was really interesting. Yeah, that was uh, 
Interesting. So, baby, how do you feel like Trogues is like scale one to ten? How is Trogues sort of assimilating to Ashland? Is it culture shock for him? Is it culture shock for you being back? Um, like what? Like what are the what are the challenges right now? Well, baby, I mean, challenges for me are just being back. Um, for yeah. Trogues, um, this is like returning home for him. So, Trogues grew up in Indiana, PA, which yeah. is which is literally it's it's so much like a town that this is just like returning home for Trogues, man. Like there he's never go. felt he's he's never felt more more at home in his life uh, besides the fact of when he was home like years ago, right? Yeah. But um, but he was coming from Tallahassee, Florida, which was not a great fit for Trogues. Not yeah. a big fan of the heat and the sunshine. Trogues mm-hmm. in general is more of what we would refer to as a northerner he, yeah. he likes he likes a little more of the uh he, he he's likes kind of a darkness guy he likes the little, overcast a little more darkness a little more downcast and overcast and uh, mm-hmm. so he's he told me he's feeling right at home baby like this is it for him like he's just wow. like i feel like i've come home yeah, baby this is the end of the line for love it. he's gonna love it when the sun goes down at like 327 in the afternoon in, in absolutely. december it's gonna be his yeah, favorite absolutely yeah he, he loves it he's Give me a couple of big hugs to show me how much he's loved it. And, uh, is he a hugger? I've never met him in person. No, he's, he's not a hugger. He, he shook my hand today, and I was like stunned. Yeah, so. wow. Physical, physical content. That's a lot for Trokes. It's a lot. Um, now, baby, you broke this news on Twitter, and as as is often the case, you know things can can get a little out of control on Twitter. But um, as we were doing our two minutes of show prep this afternoon, you indicated that. You're feeling a little bit of like disdain for Twitter. You you and Twitter are kind of on the outs. Like you're having a little uh, a little spat. Can you uh, can you unpack that a little bit? Well, baby, no. I mean, the the reality is that I'm not having a spat with Twitter. What I'm okay. having a spat with is everybody on Twitter talking about Twitter as if Twitter is ruining their lives as they're continuing to tweet on Twitter and read everything they can as fast as they can on, t- on Twitter <laughs> while right. just talking about that being on Twitter is like the worst thing about their tweeting lives. It's like going to a public pool and being like, oh, this is so gross. I hate it. It's the worst. And it's like and just standing not stepping a, out of it. It's like standing in like a pond of like alligators and saying, it's insane that my feet are in this pond of alligators and these Getting alligators are off. nipping at my feet. Yeah. But like, man, what happened when the pond used to only have like three alligators? Now the pond has like 10 alligators. And gosh, I don't know what to do about standing in this pond with all these alligators. So it's like it's gotten to this thing where like they're, they're not even talking about things anymore. They're not yeah. thinking thoughts anymore. They're just like typing the word Twitter. They're just tweeting the word Twitter on Twitter now. That's what they're doing. Don't you hey, miss I think it, I'll Ted? Post something. Let me write Twitter. Let me just. What's tweet that pipe? Twitter. I said, don't you miss it? I, I do. So okay. So you guys are on Twitter. I'm not. Piper, have you noticed this phenomenon as well? Uh, yes, a hundred percent. I actually. So I have a. I have like a list of tweet drafts that I. They just think thoughts that pop into my head, and I'm like, that might be a tweet, but I should probably sit on it so I don't get fired, or yeah. I don't know if it's funny or not. That but seems one of, wise. One of them. Yeah. This is. Uh, this is this is how I this is how I have matured as a grown up. I, I tweet this way now. But one of them is basically a tweet aimed at all of these people saying all of you whining about Twitter being such a negative place, like you know it's up to you who you follow, right? Like you don't have right. to follow people you don't like. That's yeah. utterly voluntary. Right. Uh, and yeah, so people are just like, oh, Twitter's such a negative place, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, you know what makes things negative? Complaining and following jerks. Like you don't have to follow jerks and you don't have to complain. Neither of those need to happen, and then Twitter gets less negative. But mm. but people would much rather follow those they hate and then whine about it, as far as I can tell. And yes, like there's disappointing news stories and whatever, but sure. But like that's not Twitter's fault. That's just right. like that's on CNN, that's on Fox News, that's on whatever. So I don't I don't totally understand the phenomenon of people blaming Twitter for negativity. Also, not to get too like theological about it, but isn't the world just a negative place because of the human heart? And and isn't Twitter, if not tw- Twitter, is nothing if not a way to sort of be kind of twenty four seven dialed into the world, right? So in your in your pocket or however you consume Twitter, you're just getting kind of like this constant barrage of everyone's thoughts, um, and they are going to be negative more often than not, just because of the, how the human the human heart is is sinful, I guess. So, well, especially um, when you remove any of like the obstacles and filters, Twitter's the easiest place right. to be the worst version of yourself because there's there's minimal cost 
to right. berating somebody, to criticizing somebody, to naming names, to whatever it is. And so, yeah, like there's a lot of crap that goes on on Twitter. But again, you don't have to engage it. You don't even have to see it if you don't want to. You can just unfollow it. You can mute it. You can like there's a lot of ways to make Twitter a thoroughly enjoyable experience with some negative downsides. But I mean, that's life too. Like you can you can build a life that's largely enjoyable with some downsides as opposed to largely terrible with some upside. And, that's true. and I feel like most people are the latter on Twitter. It's they just they whine and moan about it and then occasionally they're like, "But this is why I stay on." Yeah. So, so this is my question and, and Ron, you can address this and then pipe. I want to hear you on this too. So you, you basically have a product in Twitter that is in many ways, not at all a product. It's just a conduit to other, like, like a mass, a massive number of other people's thoughts and emotions and Twitter is just the conduit. So are we ever going to get to a point where enough people get out of the pond so that the product doesn't work anymore? Like is, is anybody from our, t- our tribe sort of, publicly stepping out of the pond? Um, or are people just staying in it and complaining about it? Uh, R- Ron, what, do you, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think that, I think if we were to, like, if we could somehow, like, if we could somehow, you know, look at a list of all the people in our pond, and mm-hmm. yeah, just the, the ones that you don't see on Twitter, just the ones that have, you know, probably chosen never to engage in it, or they engage in it so infrequently because they yeah. just don't care, or because it did something bad to their heart to, yeah. to constantly read these things and get so riled up. And so they, you know, kind of like you, Big T, you decided to back yeah. away because it wasn't doing anything great for you. And yeah. so you just, you made a, you made a discerning decision in terms of, of pulling away from it. Um, you know, it, it's funny because it's like, you look at these things where people come together and they interact and they they have a forum now where they're able to you know communicate their thoughts on a, you know a variety of unlimited items. It's like what what direction did we did we think this was going to go in? That's like right. did we did we think that this thing was just going to continue to get like better and better to where all we're doing now is tweeting all this beautiful loveliness? I mean right. I mean. I, like I think there at, are I mean, people who actually do think that like that they're the types of people who like, you know, a video gets posted of like somebody rescuing a puppy from a storm drain and they're like, I have faith in humanity. And you're like that. That's just like <laughs> a basic, decent human thing to do. And also look at the rest of the news. Um, but, yeah, I think there are absolutely people who who can't believe that Twitter is a plate. That's like a, it's like an idea cesspool. Yeah, they're stunned by it. Yeah. And I know. And it, it's so it's I think it. You know, there's there's an interesting dynamic with that, right? It's almost like people that complain about our podcast. It's like, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you except for the fact that this is a this is a free service, free service, right. and you never have to click on it or subscribe to it. Like, ever. it's the lowest obligation thing really imaginable. You and, know, and like you're not social- even going to run into it. You know, exactly. Yeah, by you accident, you right. wouldn't run across it. And even know. social media, it is like a completely like zero obligation entity in everybody's life to the, for the most part. All right. For the most part. Yeah. And I know you can make, I know you can f- find some nuances in that, you know, um, some people need to be on social media. Some people, it's their job to market on social media. I'm not trying to get into the weeds with this, Sure, sure. but, um, but it really is like, it is something that is optional for almost everybody. And then what, what I, what I crack up about, and you're going to like this pipe, like one of the things that drives pipe up the wall that he has tweeted about often is people that make an announcement that, Hey, I'm going to be off of Twitter, you know, for the next two months or whatever. Oh, it's my favorite. Yeah. I love that so much. Dude, but no, I tell I, you, I, there's, hold I do on, want to get into the weeds about that. Like there's a little something, bit. there's something even better than that to me. And it's the people that get on Twitter and they tweet about threatening to get off Twitter forever. Right. Because like, I'm going to do take it, it anymore. Really? Like, I'm going to do it. Like, yeah. I'm threatening. I'm threatening. I, you know what? I just Somebody can't stop take me. it anymore. Yeah. I'm just, I'm thinking about just giving yeah. this up. Bye, yeah. Bye, Felicia. Like, just get on out of here. I mean, I'm, I'm waving to you right now. It's an audio medium. You can't see me, but this is me waving. I just appreciate Felicia's tweets so much. Bye. So, you know what? You know what's even better than that, though, boys? And I don't, I don't want to get too, like, glum about this. But from time to time, um, we will have people who will, like, kind of kind of send us divorce papers from the program um and people and and these are mostly pastors and and you know tip of the cap to them they why, why say something in no words when you can say it in ten thousand? but uh but but it's usually a long letter wait that's the uh, gospel coalition's motto <laughs> exactly it's usually a long letter with lots of words on uh, on why they're leaving the program now 
And, and one, one minor pet peeve. It's not only a lot of yeah. words. There are no paragraph breaks. Dude, why like, do people, they don't, they don't why even people format this so that I break. can read it? Like, it's just this block of text, and I'm like, oh, I give up before I even right. started. Right. Make your really mean thing at least easy on the eyes. You know, if you're <laughs> if you're going to make me wade through 10,000 words on why you hate my show, at least, like... Legibility yeah. makes everything better. It really does. It really does. But uh, also, so, for, for listeners considering this, I really prefer bullet points. Like actually, for, just just we lay, lay out your just complaints and bullets, it, it, or don't lay out your complaints at all. But but it, it's a really funny, and I think this is a now thing, right? Like I think this is a today thing, and it's it's a vestige, Ron, of of what you talked about vis-a-vis -vis Twitter, which is like you can't make a decision about a good or about a service without going public with it, right? Like you can't just stop listening to a podcast or a radio show, or you can't like choose one brand of, of, you know, baloney over another without like letting people know <laughs> why this is my reasoning. Like I'm about to do it. I'm gonna, you know, um, subtext, somebody stop me because you want to keep reading my clever tweets. I mean, it, it's, is, is there any like hope to this? Like, is this going to make us better or move us forward in any way? Like, do you see any upside to this Ronald? Um, I you know, that, I mean, that's like trying to predict the future, man. I, you know, it's yeah. like, it's so weird because it's like all I can, this is all I can see. And again, I'm not one of these like, you know, theorists, right. But all I can see is that these things become, they get, they, they reach a breaking point and it usually happens when there's something new that kind of pops out that everybody can get on and essentially start doing the same thing, but with a bit of a twist. Um, and, and then be, you know, before that thing, after a few years starts like wearing itself thin, but I don't know, it's like anything else. At some point there's going to be something that replaces Twitter as the way to interact online, get information out, promote services, and it's going to be quicker, better, you know, more fluid. And everybody's going to hop on that. Twitter's going to become what Facebook has become. And then again, but eventually, because we're talking about human beings that do this, it's going to reach a point to where it's going to be untenable for people because, Everything goes sour when you put human beings together of who are, you know, mostly, you know, un unsaved and unsanctified and even saved and sanctified people. Right. Sure. So um, I, I, the flip side to this is that, I mean, so almost every time Twitter comes up on this show, mm -hmm. it's because of something kind of obnoxious that happened or negative that happened or silly that right. happened or whatever. <clears throat> the vast majority of interactions I have on Twitter are good. Like it's, it's fun, it's lighthearted, it's encouraging, mm -hmm. it's somebody shared an article that was worth reading or a book recommendation that I wanted to learn about or, I mean, just like myriad ways that Twitter is great. We just don't talk about those that much because those feel like normal, positive human interactions. It's when it gets insane. But Pipe, hold on. You don't though, but you're like, like I never, like I have a, I have like an, I have like a personal policy where I just don't really argue you know, on online. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really, well, I don't really see you do that much either is what I'm saying. So like, you don't really, you don't allow yourself to get into these like knockdown drag out, like back and forth. No, debate. what's arguments. the point? I mean, I've, I yeah. like a, a good knockdown drag out argument with a human, not with an avatar. And I don't care if the avatar is a real person on the other end. Like I don't, I want to, you know, that, that's not, that seems like something that is better done across the table from somebody or in a car with somebody or like just in person than, then on Twitter, yeah, I, I have no interest in in social, you know, waging of war. That's dumb. right, but that's why that's why you're gonna. So that's why for someone like you or like me, like I'm not like I'm not angry all day. Like I click on Twitter a couple times. A day, like I'm not angry. Like I'm not scrolling down. Just in my anger is just you know increasing as I'm scrolling. Like it just doesn't really happen for me because I don't know. I just. I'm not, I'm not looking for something to aggravate me that I can start debating on and arguing with, you know? And I, it, so for me, it's like, I almost have a, a healthier relationship with Twitter, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, having the self-control to sit some arguments out and by some, I mean, all, uh, is, is, I mean, that's how Twitter gets, I mean, it moves from like, I can barely tolerate this to like, I really enjoy this. I don't argue about anything on Twitter. I don't argue about David Platt praying for the president. I don't argue about Beth Moore being on stage at J.D. Greer's church. I don't argue about theology or whatever. Like, none of it is worth it on Twitter. And so Twitter's a fun place. The one thing I will argue about is sports because it doesn't matter and there's no emotional investment. Well, and Piper, as we ascertained last week, sports is one of the, like, two things that you're allowed to have an opinion on as who you are. So... Um, I think, I think you've just learned what 
um, what the rest of us probably need to learn. Uh, and, and we'll do so eventually, hopefully. But uh, boys, Ronald has a hard out here uh, in a few minutes, and I want to get to this last topic before Baby, we take, wrap. Baby, take five to ten. Five to Baby, ten I'm minutes. going to take five to ten with this, okay? Because right. I want to I want to hear you on this because you're a man of the cloth, and this concerns a, a colleague of yours, another man of the cloth. Uh, Platty, one of our favorite guys here on the podcast, uh, was in the news recently, huge news, in that uh, apparently Donald Trump visited his church, and Platty prayed for him, and this made... Uh, a whole bunch of people mad and it made some other people encouraged. Maybe I'm an idiot and you guys explain this to me, but like, I, I, I just sort of feel like an opportunity to have the president in your church and pray for him is a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure I see the downside to it, even regardless of his motives, right? If this had been Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or any other president, I like, I just think a chance to pray for a president in a really solid church where he's going to hear like the gospel celebrated is a, is a pretty good thing, but maybe I'm a simpleton. Uh, Ronald, walk me through this issue. Why are people so upset about it? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, what you said is true, big T. I mean, you know, very, you know, Paul very clearly says, you know, pray for those in authority, pray for the King. And so, I mean, that's, that's kind of a no brainer. I think, I think what you're, I, I think what you're seeing is your, I think the big, the big word here is optics, right? So yeah. we're getting all techie right now. Oh, so the goodness. Big, the, the sooner that word just floats right out of the vernacular, the better. I hate that word so much. Yeah. But anyway, so, carry on. Well, yeah. So big T. So this is what it's, so, so the people that are really critical of it, and by the way, I mean, if you, if you kind of read what Platy had to say, about, he wasn't really left with a lot of options, I, yeah. you know, depending on what, what you agree with. And, and you know, so the, the president kind of walks in and, you know, what do you do? But you pray for the president and his prayer was really sure. spot on. And it was just, you know, the gospel was in the prayer. You know, I mean, it was it was a good prayer for a guy that had to do something on the spot that yeah. I mean, you know, imagine being in that particular situation. And again, we all trust Platy and his theology and, you know, his track record speaks for itself, all that. Sure. So what, what people are critical of is that um, the, the position that it put him in, in terms of a lot of Trump supporters and um, f- what, it, what it looked like in terms of him looking like somebody that was trying to promote his own platform. And then, you know, what this means for, again, you know, evangelicals and politics and what this says about evangelicalism as as a whole, because now here we got this leader that is, you know, again, for if people don't decide to read the article, they're looking at Platt with his with his hand on the shoulder of President Trump. And so that that says something that speaks something that looks like something to people that aren't going to get into the weeds of learning what was really happening and how this thing came about. And so uh, what a lot of people would say is that this confused and this um, this added fuel and fire to a lot of to a lot of uh, people's concerns about you know evangelicalism and Christianity and probably reformed theology when you get into our tribe and all of these things and you know Piper can probably speak in a little bit, a little dude. Bit so is anybody who we would consider like legit in our tribe, like like guy, guys that we would like or celebrate or whatever, are any of those people mad at Platy? Yeah, they're mad. Yeah, some really? are specific, like specifically uh, specifically minority church leaders because the and, – and I think there's validity of the argument b- because of the track record of the Trump administration in terms of being essentially negative towards anybody who's a minority. Um, there's a lot of – this. this is a – this essentially is taking a positive stance towards the president, mm-hmm. which is divisive from those who are a minority. You know, so it essentially it, it excludes them. It makes them feel threatened, um, et cetera. Well, what was and, Platy supposed to say to the guy, though? Like, get out of my church. I mean, I, you right. Know, and I don't and know. so, well, I mean, there's there. I've I've seen arguments, and again, I don't. I don't know how much validity there is this. They sure, could sure. could have could have prayed for him off stage, backstage, yes. not allowed him on stage. Yeah. Yes. So the idea yeah. is like draw a line and be like you're not coming on stage. The problem is knowing how the PR uh, engine of the White House works. Imagine what would have happened then. You know. Yeah. So it, it still comes down to party politics. The people who who love Donald Trump feel one way. The people who really dislike Donald Trump feel another way. And so both sides are like, well, he should, Platt should have responded this way based on my party politics. I haven't seen a ton of sort of nuanced interaction about it that that's speaking to, 
he was totally handcuffed by this situation. It's the right. wrong answer not to let the president on stage. It's the wrong answer to let the president on stage, especially given who the president is. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen anybody complain about the content of the prayer. It's not like, oh, he prayed a bad prayer over the president. Right. It was, it's a question of should he or should he not have let him on stage in the first place. But Pipe, don't you, I mean, I guess the question is, and I kind of see it this way, uh, but he, to me, he was almost put in a no win. Absolutely. Like he, he just was a total no win situation for him. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's why, that's why bringing party politics into the church is just a disaster because you, you begin to confuse. So Platt prays a prayer that's praying essentially the dominion of Jesus over the entirety of the Trump campaign. And if there's not a thing we can all agree on beside, I mean, that, like, that should be it. Um, mm-hmm. And, but that's not the issue. Like, that's not the issue that people are hung up on. Because when you bring politics into the pulpit, into the church, you just muddy up Jesus something fierce. Yeah. And it mm. and like I think that's where that's where this thing has jumped the rails because yes, there's there are all these issues of who who is feeling threatened, who is offended, et cetera. But like, what was he supposed to do? I don't yeah. know that there was a better answer that would have led to a a less contentious outcome. Well, have fun with that one on Twitter, boys. Sounds like a real party. <laughs> Sounds really enjoyable. There's going to be a lot of progress. I only tweet Twitter now. I only just tweet the word Twitter. Just now. the That's word always. Twitter. You're a minimalist. Ron I love has it, baby. Six tweets scheduled a day, and they all just say Twitter. It's, it's <laughs> wonderful. I have his them all. Feed, all his separate. feed is just a delight. And the other ones are vacation pictures. So do you yeah, can, usually it's something about donuts. Correct. There you go. Twitter, donuts, vacation. That's it. Yeah. You gotta you gotta stay in your lane, baby. Correct. Um, well, boys, this has been uh, this has been enjoyable. It's good to have it's good to have Ronald back. It's good to have. Thanks, I boys. feel like Trogues is kind of back in the back in the tribe a little bit just because of his proximity to Ron. You know, it almost feels like he's he's back on the program. It feels but, like he's uh, right here with me. I feel I the feel whole family's all under one roof again. Is you he know, there I with can, you? Is he like sitting in the room just itching to get on the mic? Is. No, but you know what I love about Trogues, boys, is like every once in a while he asks a question about the rant. Sure. And it's usually some technical question that I almost can't answer. And I'm like, like, like I'm what, like, baby? Give us an example. Like what? Uh, like what do you guys like? What? Like what are some sponsors or what? Like what do you guys think about this? Or do you guys ever talk about this? Like it's always some question where I go, yeah, I, well, I don't know, man. You should I'm let him. Maybe. You should let him know that it's totally free and he can listen whenever he wants. He's listening yeah. to every second of every episode. Yeah, you know this. Why don't you wave hi to Trogs for us, baby? Hi, right Steve. Steve, <laughs> Stevie. Hey, Stevie, Stevie, Stevie Nicks. Uh, I love it. I love it. Boys, we have, uh, we have done what we often do on the program and that we've wandered to and fro throughout these topics. So I'm feeling a little wistful, a little nostalgic. Um, it's good to have everybody back together again. And until next time. The Happy Rant is brought to you by Resonate Recordings. If you go to ResonateRecordings.com, you can see the full range of services they offer. So if you're considering starting a podcast, they are the ones we recommend going with. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see their prices, to connect with them and ask any questions, and to see what they can do to help you launch, edit, master, and improve your podcast. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see what they can do to help you launch and improve your podcast.